Well, good morning, happy Sabbath, and we're going to begin our study with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so very thankful for the Sabbath and for the fellowship that we can have through thy spirit with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and that we can have this time to draw close to you and to one another. You know the burdens upon our hearts and the struggles of each individual. And you have given us fellowship to strengthen and encourage one another in this difficult path that we walk upon this word, upon this earth. And we know, Lord, that um, there's many times that we are responsible uh, for putting burdens and stumbling blocks in front of our brethren. And we ask for forgiveness. And that we can lift one another up. And that we can walk together. We pray, Lord, for the study this morning, that your Holy Spirit can be here, that you can help us as we share together, as we read in the spirit of prophecy and in the scriptures. Uh, a message of rebuke from you to all of us. And we ask, Lord, that this can be the beginning of the upper room experience. I know that um, to ask that of others is, is impossible. We know, Lord, it has to begin with us. And so we just ask that you can bring a conviction and a power to us as we read this council. We pray for this movement, for each of those who have participated in this movement and heard these truths, those that have been discouraged, and anyone watching this video. And we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can draw close to them, speak to them, that your angels can be around them, and that you can guide us and place our feet upon that path, and that we can walk in the light that is shining from the past. Be with us now, we pray and ask, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. And um, just a really quick review. We were studying um, Joshua chapter 22 this week. And we felt that, um, that the Lord was leading us to, to look at this story as prophetic and addressing the time that we are in. And of course, it would have other applications as well. Um, the Eastern tribes, the ones that had received their inheritance on uh, the side of the Jordan towards uh, the east, the east side of the Jordan, uh, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they had been participating in the battles of the Lord with their brethren in conquering the land and we believe it's about seven years after they crossed the jordan that they're then going to return um, to their portion to their inheritance and when they do so they um, are concerned that they may forget um, because they're they're farther away from jerusalem or from Shiloh in this case, uh, but they're farther away from the center of worship, that they're going to forget where they came from, and the Jordan River would be this boundary. And so they, they, they make an altar, an altar of witness. And it says here in verse 10, And when they came unto the borders of Jordan that are in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by Jordan, a great altar to see to, and the children of Israel heard say, be, say, heard say, 
Behold, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh have built an altar, altar over against the land of Canaan in the borders of Jordan at the passage of the children of Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered themselves together at Shiloh to go up to war against them. And the children of Israel sent unto the children of Reuben and to the children of Gad and to the half tribe of Manasseh unto the land of Gilead, Phinehas the son of Eliezer the priest, and with him ten princes of each chief house, a prince throughout all the tribes of Israel. And each one was in head of the house of their fathers among the thousands of Israel. And they came unto the children of Reuben and to the children of Gad and to the half tribe of Manasseh unto the land of Gilead. And they spake with them saying, Thus saith the whole congregation of the Lord, what trespass is this that ye have committed against the God of Israel to turn away this day from following the Lord in that ye have builded you an altar that ye may rebel this day against the Lord. Is the inquiry a peer, a peer too little for us from which we are not cleansed until this day, although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord and that ye must turn away this day following the Lord? And it will be, seeing you rebel against today against the Lord, that tomorrow he will be wroth with the whole congregation of Israel. Notwithstanding, if the land of your possession be unclean, then pass ye over unto the land of the possession of the Lord, wherein the Lord's tabernacle dwelleth, and take possession among us. But rebel not against the Lord, nor rebel against us in building you an altar beside the altar of the Lord our God. Did not Achan the son of Zerah commit a trespass? pass in the accursed thing and wrath, wrath fell on all the congregation of Israel and that that and that man perished not alone in his iniquity then the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half, tri half tribe of Manasseh answered and said unto the heads of the thousands of Israel Lord God God of gods he knoweth and Israel he shall know if it be in rebellion or if it in transgression against the Lord, save us not this day. That we have built an altar to turn from following the Lord, or if to offer thereon burnt offering or meat offering, or if to offer peace offerings thereon, let the Lord himself require it. And if we have not rather done it for the fear of this thing, saying, in time to come your children might speak unto our children, saying, what have ye to do with the Lord God of Israel? For the Lord hath made Jordan a border between us and you, ye children of Reuben and children of Gad. Ye have no part in the Lord, so that your children make our children cease from fearing the Lord. Therefore we said, let us now prepare to build us an altar, not for burnt offering, nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between us and you and our generations after us that we might do the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings and with our sacrifices and with our peace offerings, that your children may not say to our children in time. Um, Therefore said we that it shall be when they shall, they should so say to us or to our generations in time to come, that we may say again, behold, the pattern of the altar of the Lord, which our fathers made, not for burnt offerings, nor for sacrifices, but it is a witness between us and you. Now, um, I could read the rest of this, but I want to go to the spirit of prophecy here. And, and we will come back to the statement. There's some interesting uh, points there. So this is from Patriarchs and Prophets, starting on page 517. And we had gone through uh, reading this uh, um, I think Wednesday and Thursday, if I'm not mistaken, we went through this in detail. But it was more this latter part of this chapter 48. Um, two of the tribes of Israel, Gad and Reuben, with the half tribe of Manasseh, had received their inheritance before crossing the Jordan. Are you to show us? Are, are you going to share the screen? Oh. Sorry about that. Yeah, I forgot to change the share here. Okay. Thank you. There we go. Uh, the two tribes of Israel, Gad and Reuben, with the half tribe of Manasseh, had received their inheritance before crossing the Jordan. To a pastoral people, the wide upland plains and rich forests of Gilead and Bashan, 
offering extensive grazing land for, land for their flocks and herds had attractions which were not to be found in Canaan itself. And the two and a half tribes desiring to settle here had pledged themselves to furnish uh, their uh, proportion of armed men uh, to accompany their brethren across the Jordan and to share their battles till they also should enter upon their inheritance. So, of course, we know that they, they had participated in conquering the land. This is about a period of seven years that they did this. The obligation had been faithfully discharged. When the ten tribes entered Canaan, 40,000 of the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh prepared for war, passed over before the Lord unto battle, to the plains of Jericho. For years, they had fought bravely by the side of their brethren. Now the time had come for them to get into the land of their possession. As they had united with their brethren in the conflict, so they had shared the spoils. And they returned with much riches, and with very much cattle, with silver, and with gold, and with brass, and with iron, and with very much raiment, all of which they were to share with those who had remained with the families and flocks. They were now to dwell at a distance from the sanctuary of the Lord, and it was with an anxious heart that Joshua witnessed their departure, knowing how strong would be the temptations in their isolated and wandering life to fall into the customs of the heathen tribes that dwelt upon their borders. While the minds of Joshua and other leaders were still oppressed with anxious forebodings, strange tidings reached them. Beside the Jordan, near the place of Israel's miraculous passage of the river, the two and a half tribes had erected a great altar, similar to the altar of burnt offering at Shiloh. The law of God prohibited, on pain of death, the establishment of another worship than that at the sanctuary. If such was the object of this altar, it would, if permitted to remain, lead the people away from the true faith. The representatives of the people assembled at Shiloh, and in the heat of their excitement and indignation, proposed to make war at once upon the offenders. Through the influence of the more cautious, however, it was decided to send first a delegation to obtain from the two and a half tribes an explanation of their conduct. Ten princes, one from each tribe, were chosen. At their head was Phinehas, who had distinguished himself by his zeal in the matter of Peor. So um, just a couple of notes here. This, um, when they were to find rebellion in um, a city, what was the proposed uh, plan that God had set up? Anybody who's been a part of our studies or anyone who knows, what were they supposed to do if a city had rebelled against God? What was the first thing they were to do? Were they not to investigate? Right. Yeah. So they're supposed to investigate. Um, now, here they're not um i mean they could have done it worse they could have just come in and and and, and started this war and, and there is a type of investigation but it's not really according to what god had set up so the the two and a half tribes had been at fault in entering without explanation upon an act open to such grave suspicions the ambassadors taking it for granted that their brethren were guilty met them with sharp rebuke. They accused them of rebelling against the Lord and bade them remember how judgments had been visited upon Israel for joining themselves to Baal Peor. In behalf of all Israel, Phinehas stated to the children of Gad and Reuben that if they were unwilling to abide in the land without an altar for sacrifice, they, could be, they would be welcome to share in the possessions and privileges of their brethren on the other side. So there is the tribe of Manasseh on the west side of the Jordan not just on the east. Um, in reply, the accused explained that their altar was not intended for sacrifice, but simply as a witness that although separated by the river, they were of the same faith as their brethren in Canaan. They had feared that in future years, their children might be excluded from the tabernacle as having no part in Israel. Then this altar, erected after the pattern of the altar of the Lord at Shiloh, 
would be a witness that its builders were also worshipers of the living God. With great joy, the ambassadors accepted this explanation and immediately carried back the tidings to those who sent them. All thoughts of war were dismissed and the people united in rejoicing and praise to God. So we spent some time looking at this, um, looking at, at what should have been done and what was done. Now, uh, Ellen White's going to comment upon this further, but one of the things that we see is that uh, the two and a half tribes have been at fault for ent in entering up without explanation upon an act open to such grave suspicions. So we can look at what uh, these tribes had done in setting up this altar, even though it wasn't a rebellion against God, they were at fault in in doing this without explanation. So what's happening here? What is it that we're seeing in this story? I, I know that's kind of a broad question. A lack of communications, meaningful communications. Right, so there just isn't communication going on. And, and what happens when you don't have communication going on? Get uh, disorder. <clears throat> well, disorder. Okay, you have imaginings that arise, correct? Correct. Yeah. Yep. When people don't communicate, they can start to imagine um, what somebody thinks or what their intentions are. And, and if we have partial knowledge, and, and this is the problem with human beings, if we have some information about someone, we try to make sense out of it. We try to understand what it is that they're doing. And if we already have maybe a bias towards them, that can even be worse. That is, we're going to take any report that we hear and we're going to place upon it uh, the worst interpretation that, it can, that we can. That is, we're going to interpret their actions in the harshest manner. This is human nature. Um, so Ellen White's going to comment on really how we need to act and, and how they acted and, and why war was diverted. The children of Gad and Reuben now placed upon their altar an inscription pointing out the purpose for which it was erected. And they said, it shall be a witness between us that Jehovah is God. And thus they endeavored to prevent future misapprehension and to re remove what might be a cause of temptation. How often serious difficulties arise from a simple misunderstanding, even among those who are actu actuated by the worthiest motives and without the exercise of courtesy and forbearance, what serious and even fatal results may follow. The 10 tribes remembered how in Achan's case, God had rebuked a lack of vigilance to discover the sins existing among them. Now, they resolved to act promptly and earnestly, but in seeking to shun their first error, they had gone to the opposite extreme. Instead of making courteous inquiry to learn the facts in the case, they had met their brethren with censure and condemnation. Had the men of Gad and Reuben retorted in the same spirit, war would have been the result. While it is important on the one hand that laxness in dealing with sin be avoided, it is an equally important, it is equally important on the other to shun harsh judgment and groundless suspicion. Now, of course, this is a fine line in which we have to walk. And, and I'm sure many of us have experienced, especially people who live where there's snow, of um, trying to correct uh, a skid um, and going uh, from one ditch into the other. Um, I have some funny stories about that type of thing. But here in this case, we can see that it's much more serious when it comes to um, trying to address error, but also seeking to win the person in error. So what is the principle that's laid out here? If we're going to put this into a principle, uh, 
how, how would we word this? I mean, we could just take this statement and, and she's laying down the principle. But I'd how say would don't, respond, don't respond to presumption, you know, tax. And... Okay, so don't presume, don't assume. But but the but the point that I'm I'm looking at here is we need to be aware that there is error, and and I can see that I've I've used words that have hurt other people. Um, you know, very plainly when I talk about conspiracy theories and some of the things that I've said about conspiracy theories, I know that people have been hurt by my words. Now I'm trying to warn people. From something that I believe is dangerous, but maybe I've stated it in a way that people feel that they're attacked. And so I know that there are dangers that lie all around us, but the question is, am I going to say things that are going to push people away, or am I going to say things in a way that's going to help that person that is going to draw them to examine things and that's the struggle that we face as human beings even if we have as she says the worthiest motives we can sometimes create error in how we interact with one another Now, also, when accused, how are we to act? Um, no, without emotion. Defensive. Okay, so Perfect. I had Ron and Jeff. So Ron first, then Jeff. How do we? How do we react? How should we? How, how should we react? Okay. Um, with carefully chosen words, um, it's. And it's really hard to do. Okay, well, definitely we can't do it on our own. We have to have a perspective. Uh, Jeff, you got some thoughts on that? I lost my train of thought. <laughs> well, because all of us have been falsely accused, misrepresented, and and our natural reaction is um to sort of respond in kind if somebody speaks to us harshly our natural reaction is to speak back to them harshly very true yeah that's the heat of the moment yeah so one is a secret i guess is is to to step outside of yourself and to look at things from God's perspective, to recognize that it's not about you. Amen. Yeah, that sometimes when people are reacting emotionally and they're reacting to something that you're doing or saying, that there's other things going on. There's a great controversy going on within the hearts of each one of us. <clears throat> and if we are to help one another, if we are truly to do the work that Christ is asking us to do, we have to, we have to have a perspective and a trust in God that he can take care of the truth and, and that it's not really about us. Now, they're going to go back to these two events, the rebellion at Baal Peor and uh, the situation with a Aiken uh, regarding Jericho and or was it um, AI I can't remember Aiken was that after a AI right the first battle they lost at AI no. yeah. before Jericho you you this was dealing yeah. with Baal Peor and was deal with, dealing with Aiken, so. Yeah, so and Aiken was when they went and fought against AI. Right. Yeah, and then they lost the first battle and then they won. Okay, just trying to get it straight in my head. Um, so, so they're trying to protect against these errors 
which they had fallen into before. But they're overzealous in this case because God has laid out for them the path that they are to take, that there needs to be an inquiry. And, and, and of course, that didn't happen, and this could have resulted in war. So Ellen White says, while very sensitive to the least blame in regard to their course, many are too severe in dealing with those whom they suppose to be in error. No one is ever reclaimed from a wrong position by censure and reproach. No one was ever reclaimed from a wrong position by censure and reproach. Now, we have all experienced um, censure and reproach. If we're in this movement, we've experienced it. And, and I always say to, to people who uh, use censure and reproach, in, and, and not saying that we're wrong, but if they believe us to be wrong, that they're acting in a way that is not designed to redeem anyone, that it's just designed to drive people further away. And that's why she says, but many are thus driven further from the right path and led to harden their hearts against conviction. A spirit of kindness, a courteous, forbearing deportment may save the erring and hide a multitude of sins. So if we believe a brother to be an error or a sister, what are we supposed to do? Are we not to go to them? Well, I think one first is that we need to, to go to people individually. Right. You know, often we, we use the public forum to rebuke others, or we go to others to talk about the problem with such and such a brother or sister. That's not the, but that's not the uh, way it's been spelled out how we're supposed to do it. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we need to approach the person, especially if we feel that somebody has something against us. We feel a resistance. We need to, to go to that person and find out what it is we have done that has hurt them. And, and we're all guilty of not doing that. Now, sometimes we're not, we're not aware that we've hurt, hurt someone, though I think we should be I aware. Hope. Yeah. I'm so, sorry, I didn't have my... Yeah, yeah that's okay. Um, the wisdom displayed by the Reubenites and their companions is worthy of imitation. So when we are falsely accused, uh, we need to follow this example. While honestly seeking to promote the cause of true religion, they were misjudged and severely censured, yet they manifested no resentment. They listened with courtesy and patience to the charges of their brethren before attempting to make their defense and then fully explain their motives and showed their innocence. Thus the difficulty which had threatened such serious consequences was amicably settled. And so I know that I don't always follow this advice, that often I'm ready to defend myself to explain myself, but I don't know if I wait with courtesy and patience to those charges to fully understand what it is uh, that is causing offense. Even under false accusation, those who are in the right can afford to be calm and considerate. God is acquainted with all that is misunderstood and misinterpreted by man. And we can safely leave our case in his hands. He will as surely vindicate the cause of those who put their trust in him as he searched out the guilt of Achan. Those who are actuated by the spirit of Christ will possess that charity which suffers long and is kind. So we've looked at this. I mean, I've looked at this. And... And, and I've, I've had some conversations with people as well about what's been going on in this movement. And everyone, in a sense, is experiencing what they see as a misinterpretation of the word, their words and that people are misunderstanding them. 
that their intentions weren't understood in what they did. And we all feel that we have to somehow give a justification for what we did or why we said certain things. But what is it that we are supposed to do? What is it that this paragraph is telling us that we need to do? Who is our, our defense? The Lord Christ. Christ is our defense. He knows all about these misunderstandings. And sometimes we think we have to fix the problem. At least I always do. Right? And, and I often... Sometimes, right? sometimes you can't fix it. Sometimes you just can't fix it. Well, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> you understand what I mean. Especially if I think that yeah. the consequences are serious, that people are being affected you know, by what, by my perception of what's happening. And then I, and, and, and I know that I, I try to fix the problem. I'm often a very direct person in, in trying to do that, but I can often make the problem worse or the matter worse. So I've tried to learn to trust that God's going to take care of the situation. I try to be patient, but I don't think I'm patient enough. Because it takes time for God to heal the wounds that exist. And many of the wounds that we have, these are wounds that come to us throughout our entire life, through various experiences. People are hurting. People are wounded. And we have to be very, very careful of the words that we say. We don't know how much weight those words can have and how cruel they can cut and how much damage can be done to the truth to this movement it is the will of god that union and brotherly love should exist among his people and we know that you can't bring about this union and brotherly love through organizational structures you know, through having committees and can't legislate this stuff. Yeah, yeah. And we, we know that unity is an individual work. There's a work that we have to do, but it's God's will that we are united and that we show brotherly love to one another. The prayer of Christ just before his crucifixion was that his disciples might be one as he is one with the Father, that the world might believe that God had sent him. And so when we think about it, we have a message to give. Do you think that we can effectively give a message to the world, to the Levites, when we are not united? No. Won't happen. It doesn't matter what that message is, how much we understand it, what kind of machinery we put in place, how many videos we make, how how well we put together books and materials because what people will be looking at is how we treat one another. Correct. This most touching and wonderful prayer reaches down the ages, even to our day for his words were neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. So we know that this applies to us as well. While we are not to sacrifice one principle of truth, so she's reiterating what she has said earlier in this section here, it should be our constant aim to reach this state of unity. So we can't sacrifice one principle of truth, but often when we think that we're, we're standing for the truth, it's really for our opinions. It's really human pride that is motivating us. This is the evidence of our discipleship, said Jesus, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. John 13, 35. And we noted um, on Thursday that that 13, 35 goes to the prophecy of the 13, 35. It brings us to that tarrying time, which is the time that we are in. 
The Apostle Peter exhorts the church, Be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrariwise blessing, knowing that ye are here unto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. Now I'm just going to go to another uh, Spirit of Prophecy quote here. And, and this is one I've used in a number of my papers. It's been one that I've uh, presented, um, especially in presenting the 2520 to, to the brethren in the church. And, and I believe it's a counsel that we all need to follow. This is um, from letter 21, 1888. And this is actually a letter to G.I. Butler. It's quite a fascinating letter to read. There's actually quite a few statements in here uh, in this letter and in the next part of this letter because it's written in two parts, letter 21 and 21A, both written to G.I. Butler, that we've used um, in, at other times. But this statement here um, is in uh, the context of how Brother Butler was treating Jones and Wagner but it would apply in any circumstance. If a brother differs with you on some points of faith or some points of truth, do not stoop to ridicule. Do not place him in a false light or misconstrue his words, making sport of them. And this has happened in this movement. We talk about, we think about, if we think about the fact of how we have been treated by the church. We should be very self-conscious or very aware of not doing the same thing to our brethren. Do not misinterpret his words and wrest them from their true meaning. This is not conscientious argument. Now, the reason why people do this is to win an argument. That is, you look at the weakest points of what someone's saying, or even misrepresent the points of what someone's saying, so that you can win the argument. Of course, you're not really winning, right? Because truth is not, um, truth is not helped by error. Do not present him before others as an heretic. When you have not with him, investigated his positions, taking the scriptures text by text in the spirit of Christ to show him what is truth. And of course, we would want others to do that with us, with the 2520 and other things that this movement believes. We are actually asking people to take the time to investigate what we say and not just misrepresent it, not just mock us, not just censure us, cut us off. And so we need to be willing to do that with others. You do not yourself really know the evidence he has for his faith, and you cannot clearly define your own position. Now, why does she say you cannot clearly define your own position when you are um, not understanding another person's position? What does that mean? So if you can't understand, or if you haven't taken the time to uh, understand the other person's position, how, how, how could you know where you're coming from for him? Because you're supposed you're trying to be this witness. Okay. Now, you know, and, and I've puzzled about this part of the sentence because well, what if I believe that I actually can define my own position quite clearly do I really need to know what that person is teaching? I could just present my position and say, I understand the truth. Here it is. But she's, she seems to be implying that when we're dealing with someone that we're in disagreement with, and we have to misrepresent him, that maybe we don't clearly understand or cannot clearly define our own understanding of something that Part of understanding the truth is, is being able to defend it 
in a way that um, can convince the person that we are uh, defending it against, if that makes sense. She says, take your Bible and in a kindly spirit weigh every argument that he presents and show him by the scriptures if he is in error. So he may not be in error. You may not fully understand everything. And I believe that none of us fully understand everything. It's extremely important. I find that when I have a resistance to somebody, especially personally, and they are saying something, and I feel that, that resistance, that I need to take special care to actually open my mind to understand what they are saying. I'm not going to allow Satan to snatch, snatch from me some precious gem of truth just because I have a bias or personal feelings about an individual. When you do this with unkind feelings, you will do only that which is your duty and the duty of every minister of Jesus Christ, of every member of the church. This is our duty in dealing with people who differ on some points of truth. Now, what we like to do is if we don't particularly like a person and we have some differences, we try to make those differences bigger than they are. We try to make them salvational. If this person doesn't accept this view or this understanding, then that person is lost. And all of us have made those types of statements. As I said, I've made statements regarding people believing conspiracy theories that I think would fit this uh, rebuke, that I need to be rebuked for making those strong statements. Because I don't think anybody was really helped by them. Even though I may have had, you know, motives to help, I hadn't followed this counsel that I want other people to follow. So that's all I have to say. Does anybody want to share uh, before we have a short season of prayer? Uh, anyone have anything to share? Uh, mm -hmm. You know that so saying, let go, let God? Mm -hmm. I think that's the uh, uh, real thing. Like, um, that's the where you find rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to trust in God that he can take care of a situation. A situation that's beyond our control. And of course, other people are beyond our control. But there is an active thing that we can do. I mean, what we're doing here this morning is we're coming together to look at something and to pray for one another. And hopefully each of us can be more effective as we interact with one another. That we can follow this counsel. Any other thoughts? And thank you. For yeah, that. the last the past week I was discussing things with some of my kids and some uh, my son-in-law. We were talking about homeschooling, the advantages of homeschooling, and how there's, as one of my sons put it, so much gender BS and politics being foisted on young people in school right now. And then I started to talk about how I had homeschooled up till the kids were in grade five. Mm -hmm. inclusively and you know help with folks as kids help 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 to tutor them in certain subjects and what have you and then I started to exalt God I said the main basis for our education has, has to be the word of God and then my son-in-law of course interjected he's extremely worldly uh, you when you talk of God you lose me sorry so I prayed about it and I waited two days and then I responded to him and I said how Christ through my, but when I said, I plan to suicide by the age of 20. I said, with all the hardships and sorrows that I have gone through, and most of which, of course, were my own problems, right? My own self-will and what have you brought on a lot of the 
the stuff that I've gone through in my life. I mm -hmm. said, without Christ, I wouldn't be alive today. I wouldn't be around. It, it, I testify because of his long suffering, because of his salvation. I am where I am today and I'm still growing in him. And I hope and I pray that you will come to know the joy and the truth that is found in Christ. And I left it at that. Well, my son-in-law, my I mean, my son, one of my sons came back and he hasn't received the Lord yet, but he's getting more and more receptive. And he said, he said to my son-in-law, I said, Jay, sheesh, listen to her. And I thought, wow, that is absolutely amazing that he would come and defend me because I refuse to defend myself. Like I could have called my son-in-law an ignorant slob, which would be my natural tendency. But I just thought I'm going to be patient with him. I remember what I was like when I was lost and I was a lot worse than him. So let's have that long suffering and that love and, well, and try to try to uh, present Christ in as attractive a way as possible, as Ellen White says. Yeah, and the thing is, we know how patient God has been with us. And, oh, and what, man. And what we expect of others and how they treat us, we should at least treat others in that, what we expect. So we, we don't have much time here. Um, we got about, well, the Canadian group or the American group study is going to start in about 15 minutes. But any other comments? Dwight, you have some thoughts? Not yet. Okay, I would like a few people to offer prayer for this movement. And uh, um, can we have some volunteers? I will close. Okay, so Dwight will close. I can open, and uh, that gives a few other people uh, opportunity. Anybody else who would like to um, offer prayer? Yeah, I'll, I'll pray again. Okay, so Angela, anyone else? Yes, I'll pray too. Okay, Tom. Okay. So I'll just open with a prayer, and then we'll have Tom, then Angela, then Dwight. Okay. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this Sabbath. And you know the burden that's upon the heart of each one of us. You know the struggles that we face. And we just pray, Lord, that you can forgive us. I ask, Lord, for forgiveness for my sins for the words that I have spoken that have hurt others, even if they were unwitting. We know, Lord, that they still need forgiveness and the blood of Christ to cleanse them. We ask, Lord, that we can be corrected, that each one of us can recognize the hurt and harm that we can do, that we can forsake those actions, that we can seek to be reconciled to our brethren, and that we can follow the counsel given in the Bible in the spirit of prophecy in dealing with those that are erring, but also those that um, have hurt us and misrepresented us. Help us to act as the tribe of Gad and Reuben and the half-tribe of Manasseh acted when falsely accused. And help us to be clear in our position to not make the error that they did. Be with us now and throughout this Sabbath, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to you as a movement and as individuals, we ask that you would increase your care in our life. Help us to grow closer together and to better understand you. As we come to study your word, and try to find the things that are important for us in these days. We ask that you would continue to lead us and guide us as you have done in the past. Mm -hmm. We pray for each individual member that has joined us today and those who will watch the video in the future, that they will com come to understand our positions and how we want to follow Christ, how we use the spirit of prophecy and how we use the Bible and how we study using 
figures and symbols to help us gauge where we are in this movement, how we have suffered in the past and how we have come through those sufferings as a people as we come together. This is our prayer to you, Father, through the blood of Jesus Christ, that we all may become one in you. Amen. Amen. Father, we ask you again to help us divest ourselves of ourselves and to reflect you, that you must increase and we must decrease and help us to be instruments in your hands of healing. Help us to be firm in truth, but to carry your spirit and to express your spirit of long suffering and agape, true agape, selfless love. For those who are lost, for those who are seeking, for our brothers and sisters, for our attackers and enemies, help us, Lord, to uplift you, uplift the cross, uplift the risen Savior, to show your recreative power in our own lives as we live day by day. Help us to have that moment-by-moment -moment surrender that we definitely need to win those who are still in in the valley, trying to decide which way to follow. Help, help them, Lord, to discern truth from error and help them to find people who will embrace them and lead them in the ways of truth and righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. Gracious Father in heaven, as we come before you on the Sabbath, we thank you for this time of rest. We thank you for this time of restoration. Yeah. Father, help us now. Direct us. There are many times, Father, that we are presented with words that are sharp and cutting. There are many times that I have presented words that were sharp and cutting. Forgive me of my sins, Father. Forgive me of those times that I have hurt others, that I have not acted in the manner in which you would have acted. Help me, Father that my words may be sweet, for I never know when I may need to eat them. Direct us now, Father. When we are confronted by stones that are thrown, when we are confronted by comments that are cutting by those that we care about, May we learn from that which you endured upon this earth in the person of your son. We know this time is short. We know that there is little time left to be able for our characters to become more like yours. Help us to make good use of this time Mm -hmm. that we may accept your character as ours. Help us in this way that we may learn and be guided in the way that you would have us to walk. Be with us on the balance of this Sabbath day. Help us to learn more of you, to be guided of you, and to make use of the lessons that you have given in the past that are to show us the path that we are to walk today. Help us now, for this is our prayer. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Recording stopped. Well, thank